second wind a little bit. Like I, yesterday, I think you guys were getting drained just a little bit, and something happened. I don't know if you rated the energy drinks closet or what it was, but but I'm sensing a little bit more life tonight. That's good. That's good. I'm glad you guys are here. I'm excited for what the Lord has for us tonight. Let's pray as we begin. <clears throat> Father, we love you. I'm thankful for these teenagers, and I'm thankful for these counselors. And I pray, God, that you would just be working in all of our hearts and lives throughout the course of this week. And I thank you for those that are here that have been willing to serve. And, and I thank you for the kids that have been attentive to your word. And I pray, God, that tonight would be another night where we're all attentive to the things that you have for us. Would you soften hearts? Would you help me to get out of the way so that your word can have free course and be glorified? And God, we just want to make much of you. You're worthy to be praised. You sacrificed all for us. And we want to lay our lives down for you. And we love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we have been talking this week about living in the, in the victory and the abundance of the unstoppable life. And, you know, it's, it's sad. Most people, even Christians, they, they live defeated lives never living in the fullness and never living in the abundance that God intended for them. And in so far, what we've done is we've looked at a few examples from the Old Testament that kind of give us some insight into what this thing of an unstoppable life is, is really all about. On the first night, we saw that negative example from the life of Samson, and then we looked at a positive example from the life of Daniel. And, and then last night, we looked at how God had made Joshua unstoppable. God told Joshua, he said, I, I've made you unstoppable to go in and possess the land that I promised to your people, but it's not going to be easy. So you're going to need to be strong and courageous if you're going to do it. And, and, and that though we need to follow all of God's principles, being strong and courageous is essentially a some uh, sort of overarching principle that we better be sure that we apply it to our lives and we better be sure we're aware of if we're going to seek to follow God with all of our lives. And we saw that God is telling us, just like he told Joshua, you're going to need to be strong and courageous because there are some specific battles that I'm going to have you to fight. You have a specific purpose. You have specific tasks in your life that God wants for you to accomplish for his mission. So, so many people out there, they're, they're looking for purpose and meaning in life. And God is saying, I've already provided this for you. You're looking in all the wrong places. And, and we saw that God's telling Joshua, God's telling us just like he told Joshua, you're going to need to be strong and courageous because you're going to need to follow my word down to the letter. But, but you can be encouraged because you're able to be strong and courageous because I'm going to be with you wherever you go. And, and so that's what, that's, what we, that's what we learned last night. God has made us unstoppable. But like we've seen, it's only by the power of God. It's only through the principles of God and only for the purposes of God. And, and so as we've been talking about how being unstoppable works. And, and as we've looked at what we can learn from some examples in the Bible. There, there's a key element of this whole thing that we just haven't had a whole lot of time yet to cover. And, and it actually happens to be the most important piece of this whole puzzle. As far as living the unstoppable life is concerned, what we're going to talk about tonight is actually the most important part of the whole puzzle. But, but in order to better understand what this piece of the puzzle is, what I want us to do is that I want us to understand some things about some appointments that God has for us. When we understand some things about what God has appointed for us or, or the appointments that God has currently scheduled for us, then we'll understand what this missing piece of the puzzle is. Do you, do you realize that God currently has two appointments scheduled for every person in this room? You've got two appointments scheduled, and, and it's of the utmost importance that we understand what those appointments are. And so tonight, first, I, I want us to look at our mandatory appointment. The first thing I want us to see is our, our mandatory appointment. Have any of y'all ever had a, an appointment or a 
meeting with someone and you're supposed to be at a particular place at a particular time and you completely forgot about it and you missed your appointment. That's, that's the worst feeling in the world, getting a call from the person you're supposed to meet and as you see their name on your phone, you're going, oh no, right? You haven't even brushed your teeth yet. And, you, and, and that, that's the worst. But this mandatory appointment that we're looking at right now is nothing like that appointment. So you see, this is an appointment that God has for us. It, it isn't the kind of appointment that you can sleep through your alarm and miss. It isn't the kind of appointment where you can call in sick and miss. And this isn't an appointment that you can miss if you forget about it. This is an appointment that we're going to keep whether we like it or whether we don't. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. It describes this particular mandatory appointment that we all have that I think is very important for us to see and understand this evening. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. It says... And as it is appointed unto men once to death, but after this the judgment. We all have a mandatory appointment with death. It, and I know that when you're young, that's not typically something that you consider a whole lot. Well, actually, with all the death and the skits last night, maybe this is a unique group. Maybe, maybe you guys do think about it a lot. Poor Nemo. <laughs> you guys are sick. <laughs> no, but I, but I understand that when you're young, you don't think about death a whole lot. I, I get it. But the reality is, listen y'all, as morbid as it sounds, the moment each of us were born and the moment each one of those sweet babies is born across the globe, on this planet, there are four babies born into the world every second. The second each one of those babies is born, they all had one appointment that they were guaranteed, just like when we were born. There was only one thing that we were actually guaranteed when we came into this world, and that's at some point, it's going to all end. At some point, we're going to die. It's the same for each and every one of us. We're not promised our next meal. We're not promised our next dollar. We're definitely not promised our next breath. But what we're promised is that no one's getting out of here alive. What kind of camp is this? <laughs> the horror movies just ramped up another notch from the skits. Listen, no one's getting out of here alive, y'all. We are on a collision course with death, each and every one of us. At birth, we got the one-way ticket. Now I get it, the, the, one ex, the one exception to the rule, of course, are those that will be raptured out of here. Enoch pictures that for us in the Old Testament, just like us. Enoch is taken off of the planet, right, without tasting death, right before the judgment of Noah's flood came. And he's picturing for us those of us that will be taken off of the planet without tasting death, right before the judgment of God is coming in the tribulation period. So that's the exception to the rule, but other than Enoch... And other than those people that will be raptured, each and every person that has ever lived will die. We, we weren't assured of anything else in our lives but that. And you say, well, man, isn't this the most uplifting message I've ever heard? But let me assure you, I don't like talking about death any more than y'all like listening to it. But I will tell you this. If we live our lives comprehending the reality that as we pillow our heads each night, we've got one less day on this planet than we did before, it'll change the way we live our lives. Each night we pillow our head, y'all, it's, it's, it's one less day, it's just the math. When we com comprehend that, that we have an appointment with death, it, it changes our perspective. For those of us that are believers in Jesus Christ, what it ought to do is light a fire under us to invest in the eternal and store up treasures in heaven because with each passing day, we've got one less day to do that. For those of us are here that may have never called on the name of Jesus to save you, knowing you have an appointment with death ought to change your perspective too. 
Because each night you pillow your head, you have one less opportunity to call on Jesus' name to save you before it's too late. Because here's how it works. Though we have a mandatory appointment with death, we also have a voluntary or optional appointment. We have an optional appointment, number two on your study sheet. We also have an optional appointment. You see, we've got a, this optional appointment that we choose to schedule that's based on our willful choice that we make that actually determines the result of our mandatory appointment. Like we just saw, our mandatory appointment is death, but we have an optional willful choice to make that schedules another appointment for us that determines the outcome of our death. It determines what comes next. The first appointment is scheduled by God without our consent. The other appointment is scheduled by God, but it's with our consent. And this appointment actually determines, interestingly enough, whether or not we die once or whether or not we die twice. We're all going to experience the first death. The question is whether or not we're going to experience and have an appointment with the second death. That's letter A on your study sheet. The second death or wrath. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. This is how it's described. And this is where I get this term second death. It says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Here it is. Which is the second death. Listen, y'all. The second death is the literal burning lake of fire. And most people would rather live in denial and not face the fact that they've got a one-way ticket to their first death. It's easier to just not even think about that. But even more people would rather live in denial about the fact and not face the fact that God has designed it in such a way that their eternal destiny is dependent on a decision or a choice that they're faced with in this life. And I think some of you know what that decision is. The decision is, What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with Jesus? All of life comes down to that question. What are you going to do with the one who claimed to have existed eternally because he was none other than God in human flesh? What are you going to do with the one who predicted his own death and resurrection? What are you going to do with the one who fulfilled over 300 prophecies in his life that the holy prophets prophesied about hundreds of years before he was even born? What are you going to do with the one whose life to this day we still base our calendar around? What are you going to do with the one that claims to have the keys to eternal life? What are you going to do with the one who willfully laid down his life on the cross and died and was buried and rose again to pay the penalty for sin on our behalf so that if we would simply put our faith in Him and His work for us on the cross, we would be saved. What are you going to do with Him? And you say, well, I'm not going to do anything with Him. I haven't made a decision yet. Sorry, that's not how this works. You realize that by not making a decision, you are making a decision. By not making the decision to call on Jesus' name to be saved, you are currently rejecting the free gift of salvation that Jesus is offering to all those that believe. Listen, we don't get to soften the blow and say that we haven't made a decision yet. No, you have made a voluntary decision at this point in your life to reject Jesus. That is your decision. The only question is whether or not you're going to change your decision and whether or not you'll change it before it's too late. But right now you've made a willful one to reject Jesus' offer of salvation and that willful decision has scheduled you an appointment. It's a voluntary one. God schedules the appointment, but He schedules it based on your decision and that appointment is an appointment with the second death in hell. God scheduled your first appointment with death. It's appointed that a man wants to die, but God has designed that second appointment 
to be based on an optional, voluntary decision that you have to make. And there are only two options. Accepting Jesus, rejecting Jesus. That's it. There's no middle ground. That decision determines the appointment that God currently has scheduled for you. And if you choose to reject Christ, you are in essence voluntarily asking God to go ahead and schedule that appointment with the second death in the lake of fire. 1 Thessalonians 5.9, it calls it an appointment with wrath. 1 Thessalonians 5.9, it says God hasn't appointed believers unto wrath. And that's actually true in more than one way. He, he hasn't appointed believers to wrath in the sense that believers will be raptured off of this planet prior to his wrath being poured out during the tribulation period. But, but he also hasn't appointed believers to wrath in the sense that we won't suffer God's wrath and be cast into hell. But listen, the wrath of the tribulation period that many of you have heard about your whole life is just the precursor to hell and the lake of fire. But as believers, we don't have an appointment with death or we haven't been appointed to wrath. But what does that mean for those that don't believe? It means they do have an appointment with wrath. You see, it's like we've all been born with this disease called sin. And because of that disease, we have an appointment with the second death and wrath. And what God does is he offers everyone the cure that will save them from the disease and from this appointment with the second death or, or wrath. And the cure is faith in the work Jesus did for us on the cross. But for some crazy reason, there are people out there that continue to live their lives rejecting the cure and choose to stay sick. They keep refusing the cure so that they can get better. Their biggest problem isn't that they're sick. Their biggest problem is they refuse to get better. And so they keep their appointment with wrath, but it's based on their choice. John chapter 3 and verse 36 spells this out for us like this. It says, he that believeth on the Son, of course that being Jesus, hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not, on the, Son, believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. The wrath of God abides on you or the wrath of God dwells on you or is literally sitting on you because you have an appointment with wrath based on a willful choice to not believe. But listen, according to that verse, there's also some really good news. If you've never believed on the Son, you can voluntarily make the willful choice to choose the other option and, and to believe on Jesus' name. And, and what God does is, is He cancels your appointment with wrath and with the second death and he, he schedules you a different appointment. If there's still breath in your lungs, God is willing to schedule you an appointment with salvation. He's willing to schedule you an appointment with eternal life. Let's let it be understood. She, so eternal life or, or salvation in, in, our, in our verse in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, again it says, God hasn't appointed us to wrath, but God has appointed us to obtain salvation. Now, the, the book of 1 Thessalonians, it's a, it's a letter that is written to the church. The church, of course, is a body of believers, so this letter is written to those that already believe. So the verse is saying that God hasn't appointed believers to wrath, but God has appointed believers to salvation. And so you might say, now wait, if I'm already saved, then why do I have a future appointment with salvation? I thought I already was saved. Why does God schedule me an appointment with salvation if I'm already saved? Well, for our purposes tonight, we're not going to get into the weeds on that. But the reason is because though we are saved, our salvation isn't complete yet. It's not complete because though we got a new spirit on the inside of us the day that we got saved, we're still trapped in this body of flesh. This body of flesh wars against the spirit. But listen, there's coming a day when the war is going to be over. 
Because at the rapture, God's giving us new bodies and capable of sinning. But our salvation won't be complete until that happens. And because that is still yet future, God says, if you're saved or if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I have, enough, I have a future appointment that is scheduled for you to complete your salvation. If you're saved, you're as saved as you'll ever be. You can't lose it. But there's still something that needs to happen for our salvation to be complete. So God schedules an appointment with salvation instead of wrath. If you've never been saved and you've rejected Jesus' offer of salvation, then right at this moment, though, you do have an appointment scheduled, and it is with wrath. But Jesus' desire is to save you from that wrath, y'all. Romans 5, 9, it, it tells us, it says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Being justified by Jesus' blood, it's a, it's a reference to our salvation. And because of that salvation, those that believe have been saved from that wrath. We now have an appointment with salvation or appointed to salvation. And it's an appointment that God makes for us based on a decision that we're faced with. The decision of what are you going to do with Jesus so again, if you've chosen to reject that offer thus far in your life, then I suggest you reschedule that appointment. If you'd like God for, to make you an appointment to obtain salvation, then Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 lays out for us exactly how simple this is. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, it, it says this. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You've got to believe, and you've got to confess. You confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, or you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, or that Jesus was God in human flesh. You believe that Jesus resurrected from the dead, and that he paid the penalty for your sin, and you confess those things with your mouth. You see, God is so holy that he cannot coexist with sin. Do you understand that? Our, our sin it has separated us from God. Romans 3.23 says that, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He, he's so holy that any sin, no matter how big we think it is, or no matter how small we think it is, it made us fall short. We couldn't be good enough to stand before a perfectly holy God. We couldn't be good enough. We've all fallen short because all have sinned. And because God is so holy and just, our sin demanded that there be a penalty for that. And man, guys, that had us in a really, really bad position. Our sin demanded a penalty. That had us in a bad spot. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12 describes just how bad of a position we were in. And here's what it says in Ephesians 2.12. It says, listen, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So we were without Christ. We were aliens. We were strangers. We had no hope. And we were without God. But other than that, we were doing pretty good. That's how bad our food. That's the position our sin had put us in. But then in step Jesus. God, God is so holy that He can't coexist with sin. And, and that sin demanded a penalty. But there's another attribute of God that we have to understand. Oh, He's definitely holy. But He's also love. He's definitely holy, but He's also love. He loves us so much that Jesus stepped in and He took our place and He paid the penalty for our sin. That should have been us on the cross paying for our own sins. But Jesus took our place and our punishment and He paid the penalty for our sins. 
And then he rose again and he resurrected from the dead, proving he was God and conquering sin once and for all. He died for our sins, but listen, sin didn't get the last laugh. Jesus resurrected in victory over that, over that sin and over that death. The grave couldn't hold him back. So now through faith in who he is, he was God in human flesh. And in faith in what he did, he died for our sins and he rose again, conquering sin. Through that faith, God applies his grace to us and we can be saved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says it this way. It says, for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, so God laid down his life for us and he offers us his grace. And he offers to save us from the wrath to come that comes as a result of our own sin. And the Bible says God applies that grace to us through faith in him. Not through works, not through anything we can do to be good enough, but by faith in Jesus. Remember, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We couldn't be good enough. So God tells us to put our faith in the one who was good enough. Jesus Christ, the perfect, sinless, spotless Lamb of God who became our sacrifice. And at the moment we called on Jesus' name to save us, you know what happens? God cancels one appointment and He schedules us another one. Our appointment with wrath is canceled and God appoints us to salvation. God saves us and then He appoints us that there's coming a day in the future that I'm going to complete the salvation. Listen, there's a mandatory appointment that's coming down the pike for each and every one of us when we're going to take our last breath. We don't have any control over that appointment. It's mandatory. We're not certain when it's going to be. But God in His grace through His sacrifice on the cross, He's willing to cancel that appointment with wrath and schedule us an appointment with salvation. But it's voluntary. It's optional. We have to make it with God. But it's by your free choice. You've got the option to keep the appointment with wrath or schedule an appointment with the salvation with, uh, of salvation with God. Those are the only two choices. If you've never made that voluntary appointment through God for salvation, tonight could be the night. And what could possibly be holding you back from? And you, and you see, it's, it, it's, it's impossible for us to talk this week about living in the victory of an unstoppable life and not address the fact that if you've never called on Jesus' name to save you, you are living an extremely stoppable life. This whole thing of having a life where we live in victory, it all hinges on a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no power apart from Jesus. You only have your own strength, which will always fall short. There's no victory apart from Jesus because you can't win at anything that matters without Him. There is no purpose apart from Jesus because without Him, all you have is this temporal existence and you can't live for anything that's going to outlive you. Without Jesus living in the victory of an unstoppable life, is completely out of the question. And you say, well, good grief. Tonight we've talked about death and hell. Are you trying to scare us to death? And you know, that really is not my goal tonight. My goal is to present you with the truth from God's Word. And in order to do it any justice, I have got to share these truths with you. I'd be doing you a disservice if I didn't. And I have not had the privilege of meeting each and every one of you, which I wish I did have that privilege. I have not had it. But I do care enough about you to give you the truth. And to keep these truths from you would be the most unloving thing I can imagine doing this week. And that isn't my heart towards you. And that's not God's heart towards you either. In fact, I want to show you what God's heart is towards you. Though. Number three on your study sheet, our Savior's heart. Our Savior's heart. 
in the midst of talking about death, talking about hell, we, 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 we've also talked about the, the salvation that God desires to provide each and every one of us. But, but I want to take some time to make sure that we understand God's heart in the midst of all of these tough topics to talk about. I want to be sure that we understand specifically what God's heart really is towards each and every one of us. Because as much as I feel like I can't leave out the truth about death and hell and do God's word an ounce of justice, I also don't feel like I can leave out the truth about what God's heart towards us truly is and do God's word in the justice. Earlier we were in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, looking at the fact that we uh, at our appointments, right? Either wrath or salvation. But I want you to look at the next verse with me as well. Verse 10 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Start in verse 9, though, to, to get the context. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And here it is, who died for us. That whether we wake sleep we should live together with him so the verses say here's why Jesus died so that whether you're awake or you're asleep which in this case is a reference to whether you're alive or whether you're dead Jesus died for us so that whether we're alive or so that whether we're dead we would live together with him and I know when you're casually reading through your Bible, it really is easy to read over that phrase and not give it a whole lot of thought. But do you realize what an incredible statement was just made in this verse? The, the insight that this gives us into the heart of God is unbelievable because I want you to notice what this verse doesn't say. Verse 10 does not say, who died for us, so when we sleep or when we die, we can go to heaven. It's not what it says. No, no, this whole thing of Jesus dying to provide salvation has always been about a person, not about a place. Do you understand that? It's saying that Jesus died for us so that whether we live or die, we would live together with him. Jesus' desire is that no matter what, whether we're alive, whether he takes us home, we'll be in the same place at the same time together with him in a relationship. And to miss that is not just to miss the heart of this verse, but it's to miss the heart of the entire gospel. It, because understanding that because of God's holiness and his sinfulness, we've been separated from God and we've been appointed to wrath, it can be a very tough pill to swallow, especially if you don't fully understand that God isn't just holy, but that God is love. And he desires to have a relationship with us. He desires to live together with us. This verse tells us that that's why he died. Jesus died so that when we die, we'd live together with him. Letter A. Jesus died so that when we die, we'd live together with him. You see, at the heart of Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection, y'all, it's a God that loves us and a God that desires to have a relationship with his creations, not just haul us off to heaven when we die. And he's a God that has provided a way for all people to be saved so that they can have a relationship with our Father. He's our Heavenly Father. you realize that? Some of you don't have a great relationship with your earthly Father. Some of you don't have a great relationship with your earthly Father. And I understand that that must be very difficult. But your Heavenly Father is saying to you, but I want to have a relationship with you. And as our Heavenly Father, He's a Father that's better than any of our earthly fathers could ever possibly hope to be. He's a Father and a God that desires to live together with us. He wants to be with us. He wants to be where we are. You know what the best part of heaven is going to be? It's where Jesus dwells. That's the best part. As you guys may remember me saying, I, I live in Georgia. We, we moved 
to a new house about nine months or so ago to get closer to the church. And you know what my favorite part about our new house is? It's where my wife and kids dwell. I don't give a rip about that. But I like it a lot because that's where I go home and that's where my kids are. And that's where my wife is. That's, that's my favorite part. And listen, that's what salvation is all about. Do you understand that? It's not about the place. It's, a, it's about the person. God's heart toward us isn't simply to haul us off to a place called heaven when we die. No, we serve a God that actually wants a relationship with us and wants to live together with Him. Uh, with him and wants to live together with us. That's the part that we can't miss. We can't miss the fact that the God that created us desires that relationship. God says, I want to be where you are. Whether you're alive or dead, I want to be with you. That's why I died. One day when we've moved on from this temporal life that we're living right now, we're going to live together with the one that created us and the one that died for us. It's going to be incredible the day we see Jesus face to face and we live together with him in heaven. It, Jesus said in John chapter 14, starting in verse 2, Jesus says this, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Here it is. That where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus says he's preparing a place for us to dwell in the future. And wow, there are many mansions there. And as wonderful as that sounds and as cool as that will be, do you see what the whole point of Jesus preparing a place for us is actually all about? It's not about the place and it's not about the mansions. At the heart of all of it, at the end of verse 3, he says that where I am, you may be also. God wants us to live together with Him, so He's preparing us a place to live with Him in the future so that where He is, we're with Him too. He wants to live together with us. What an incredible thought. One of the reasons that Jesus died is for that eternal purpose so we can spend eternity with Him when we die. He wants that relationship with us. And do you know what that means? It means... What Philippians 1.21 says. That's what that means for us. It means for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. You want to talk about living in the victory of an unstoppable life? Here, how's this one for you? If you're walking in the power of the Spirit and you're, and you're living your life according to God's principles and therefore you're unstoppable to fulfill the purposes that God has for you to accomplish in your life. And in the midst of that, you're faced with the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. Something that will seemingly make you extremely stoppable, which is death. Even then, you still haven't lost and no, Satan hasn't gotten the victory. And no, it's not even a minor setback. To die is gain. The worst thing that could happen to you is that you die. And if, you're a, and if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, because of your appointment with salvation through Jesus Christ, to die is gain. He's made it so that death is an upgrade beyond our wildest imaginations. That's what we have waiting for. It only gets better from here because we'll eventually live together with God face to face. And as wonderful as that is, what I want to make sure that we see from this verse in 1 Thessalonians 5.10 is God doesn't just want to live together with us after we die. God wants to live together with us while we're alive. Verse 10 says that Jesus died so that whether we wake or sleep, we live together with us. Because you see, the thing that makes living together with the Lord so much sweeter after we die is how we live together with the Lord while we live. Our capacity to be able to glorify God when we live together with Him in the future is, depending on, is dependent upon how we live together with Him right now. 
Jesus died, not so, just so that we could have some sort of relationship with Him in the future. No, He died so that we could have a present relationship. Jesus died so that while we're alive, we'd live together with Him. Living together with Jesus, for us, it started at salvation, right? The Holy Spirit of God took up residence inside of us the day we got saved so that we live together with Him. I, I love how Jesus describes it in John 14, verse 23. This is what Jesus says. It says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and we will make our abode with him. What do people say sometimes when they have company over? You guys may not say this, but older people will say something like, Welcome to my humble abode. Have you ever heard that? God wants to make his abode with us in this life. He wants to reside in us and with us. We're his residents and he wants to live together with us. But listen, he doesn't want to just be roommates. I know that a lot of you guys haven't done the roommate thing yet, but it won't be hard for you to imagine how it works. God doesn't want to be roommates where you just pass each other coming and going. He wants to have an intimate relationship with you where you're sharing every part of your lives together. You see, God has made us his residence, but we tend to treat him like a roommate. We get busy and we go days without talking. We've got a quick conversation with him in the morning and we get a chapter or two read as fast as we possibly can so we can get to the important things in our day. Meanwhile, God is saying to us, I want to live together with you and reside in you in an intimate way throughout each day. That's why he died. God wants us to talk to him throughout each day. Like, like verse 17 of this same chapter of 1 Thessalonians says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. It says, pray without ceasing. That means God wants to hear from us all throughout the day. You ever just take the time to thank God for all that He's done for you as you're riding down the road? Is that on your radar at all? You ever just praise Him throughout the day when you think about His character and His holiness and the love that He has for you? God says, I want to hear from you and have an intimate relationship with you that goes beyond just a morning devotional, but that carries on throughout the day. I want to live together with you. He's not looking for a roommate. He's looking for a relationship like a bride. That's the intimacy of the type of relationship that God wants to have with us. And he wanted to have it so much that he was willing to die. Let me ask you, do you treat God like a roommate or do you treat him like a bride? God designed it so that whether we live or die, we'd be able to live together with him. So we have everything to live for in life. And nothing to fear in death. But that's God's heart towards us. He wants us to live together with Him and have a relationship with Him. And He's provided a way to do that through Jesus. He doesn't want us to have an appointment with wrath. He wants us to have an appointment with salvation. Listen, He wants that so much that despite the fact that we willfully have chosen sin so many times in our lives... And that sin demanded a penalty. Despite that, Jesus stepped in and said, I'll pay the penalty on his behalf. I'll pay the penalty on her behalf. All they need to do now is believe on me. And he did it because he loves you. And he did it because he wants a relationship with you. He wants a relationship with you in this life. And he wants it in the next life. If you've never called on Jesus' name... Savior. I really am begging you to take a second right now and just think about what it could possibly be that would keep you from accepting the free gift of salvation that Jesus offers. What could this short temporal existence that we're living in possibly offer you that is worth your soul? If you've never been saved, would you grab your pastor? Would you grab your counselor? Would you grab me? Would you grab somebody and get that nailed down tonight? 
Don't delay any longer. There's too much at stake. Father, we love you. And God, I thank you for your willing sacrifice on the cross for us, for the way that you love us, for the way that you've provided us access to have free, to be free from the wrath that we deserve. Thank you, God, for your son. Thank you that you want a relationship with us. How can we even get our minds around the fact that you care? But you do. And you care so much that you were willing to die and you were God, so you rose again. Father, I'm praying for those who you're stirring in their heart right now. I'm praying for those who you've been stirring in their heart. I'm praying for those right now, God, that, that they would do what, what they know they need to do right now and get things right with the one that created them. I pray tonight would be the night, and today would be the day of salvation for people in this room who so desperately need you, God. We, we thank you for how you love us. We thank you you don't just want to haul us off to a place. We thank you that you want us to have a real relationship with you. And we love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.